Cogan. I'm the director of the Sanford C. Bernstein Center for Leadership and Ethics. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to this event uh, hosted through the uh, KPMG and Stanley Cleon uh, form gift, which we got a number of, of years ago. And we're going to have tonight what's called a fireside chat, which is going to feature Professor Gita Johar, who is the Meyer Felberg Professor of Business, and then our very special guest, uh, Ms. Ariana Huffington, founder of Huffington Post and the CEO and founder of Thrive Global. So since 1993, we've had the honor of having this be one of the most premier speaker series at uh, CBS, the Columbia Business School. And the forum you know, features people from all kinds of aspects of life, from, from business, uh, policy, and academics, who have made major commitments to the pursuit of ethical, social, political, and economic challenges in their solutions. Uh, and we're very happy to have uh, this uh, forum tonight be no exception uh, to that. We have Ms. Huffington, who is known for her outstanding, courageous business uh, leadership, and also, as you're here tonight, about her uh, uh, extensive community service. She is often uh, engaged in public affairs, and she can sometimes be, uh, I, I, and I will say this, I'll look over to you so you agree, she also can be at times controversial. Um, so it's, we're really happy to have you here uh, uh, with us tonight, uh, especially given the uh, background events we're all uh, so much are aware of, and we're delighted that we'll have this event take place in conversation with uh, Professor uh, Johar. I want to thank um, the family. We're very lucky uh, to have uh, two members of the family uh, with us, uh, Leila Brooks and uh, her uh, recent fiance. Uh, so uh, should the fiance stand up, or, and, and Leila, want to stand up for us? Please, <laughs> please do that. You know, so, you know, you just have to practice this a little bit anyhow. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and her grandfather, uh, Stanley Klingon, this is named uh, in, uh, in, his, in his honor. Uh, he was an executive uh, in, in residence at Columbia School in, up until 1994. He served as the, uh, as the chief operating partner of Pete Morwick uh, International, which at that time was one of the largest accounting firms and management consulting firms uh, in, the, uh, in the world. We have a uh, uh, one more thing uh, for me to uh, acknowledge, and we're very pleased uh, uh, by this. Uh, we have the, the uh, presence of what we have described as outstanding female alums uh, here in the, you know, I guess in the first two rows. Uh, could, you, could you stand up for a second too? Is it asking too much or uh, to, uh, that we can identify you or so? Uh, yes. Right, here maybe, who's here? Yes. So these have been remarkable supporters of the school, and we are grateful to have such a strong group uh, of alumni investing in future generations of uh, CBS, CBS women. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now, without further ado, it's my great honor and direct uh, and distinct pleasure to hand it over to Professor Johar, which I'm delighted to do, and uh, to Ariana Huffington for the uh, 2008 Cleon Forum. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you, Ariana, for being here. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this is going to be an uh, exciting conversation with one of the most powerful women in the world. So let me just kick this off by asking you, how does that feel to be one of the most powerful women in the world? <laughs> um, you know, it's so funny, but I have two daughters um, who are very amused by this description. Um, you know, for me, power is always about influence and impact. And uh, the most important thing is, at, the, at this time, what impact can we all have? You know, as, as we are all aware, there, there's so much um, at stake right now in every aspect of life. And uh, all that matters is the impact we can have. And that's why it's so exciting that business schools are focusing more and more on purpose and on social impact, and that, um, what used to be just looking at the PNL and the bottom line is being rethought and re-examined. You know, I studied economics at Cambridge, and um, and the one thing that has stayed with me is the concept of the opportunity cost, 
that every time we do something, we are foregoing doing something else, and keeping that in mind as we make decisions and choices is, is what matters. So it's interesting to hear your definition of power. You seem to define it more in a very uh, inclusive way, including impact. And uh, maybe this uh, would be a good time to raise a question that came from a few people in the audience, which is how then do you define leadership and how do values feed into leadership? For me, leadership is always about um, um, looking ahead and being able to to see the icebergs before they hit the Titanic, and also being able to see the opportunities before they are completely obvious. And um, it's really an exciting moment right now because we need more and more of that kind of leadership. And what is interesting is that that kind of leadership requires reflection. And it becomes harder and harder at a time when leaders are expected to be always on, respond to every tweet, um, every event, whether important or not. Um, I think we need to re-examine what it takes to uh, tap into the wisdom that is ultimately what is essential for real leadership. Uh, it's not difficult to have leaders with high IQs. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not difficult even to have leaders with great degrees. What is difficult right now is to have leaders who are truly wise. And um, in, in one of my last books, I, I wrote about the story of uh, FDR when he was confronted with this very difficult decision about entering the Second World War. And um, obviously, England, Churchill was pressuring him to enter the war. The American public was dead against it. And he didn't know how to square the circle. He didn't know what to do. So what did he do? He did something which would be totally unheard of today. He took 10 days off <laughs> on a naval ship to think. Can you imagine anybody doing that? Can you imagine anybody taking a weekend off? So he took 10 days off, and during that time, he came up with what is considered his political masterpiece, the land lease program, which allowed him to um, enter the war and keep the public on his side. So that's just one example of the kind of wise leadership uh, which becomes harder at a time when um, politicians and other leaders, business leaders, media leaders, are expected to sleep with their phones and um, respond to everything, whether important or not. So on that topic, how do you manage to do this? How do you manage to reflect and not be on all the time? Well, first of all, let me just say that I did everything wrong for a very long time. <laughs> and then on April 6th, 2007, I collapsed. And I hit my head on my desk on the way down, broke my cheekbone. And as I came to in a pool of blood, I had to ask myself the question, is this what success looks like? <laughs> and um, and that, was in, that was really an amazing wake up call. It was something I'm incredibly grateful for because it, it had me sort of sit up and rethink my life and study. Um, what I realized was not just my burnout crisis, but our civilization's burnout crisis. Um, Pascal Chabot, a Belgian philosopher, has called burnout civiliza modern civilization's disease. And uh, it has incredible consequences and incredibly high costs. And we're now just beginning to acknowledge those costs and that's why I'm excited to be speaking to you because business schools are beginning to address the costs in ethics courses, in decision-making courses, and in courses about how do leaders recharge and are able to tap into their best leadership potential. So that's what happened to me. And at the time, you know, the Huffington Post was two years old. 
my daughters were teenagers and I was divorced. So does anybody here have teenage children or does anybody here remember what it's like to have teenage children? All I can say to you is it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> so I really felt that I was, that I just had to really give up my sleep, my taking care of myself and, and that's kind of the delusion that so many of us have had for so many years that um, in order to succeed and get everything done, we just have to burn out. That's just the price of success, and it's just not true. Do you have a practical tip for our audience on how do you actually do yes. that? Oh, absolutely. So um, after this um, collapse, you know, a few years after, after I studied the subject, uh, I wrote a book called Thrive. Um, which was really about redefining success to go beyond money and power to include well-being, wisdom, wonder, and giving. And as I went around the world speaking about it and writing about it, what people mostly wanted to talk about was sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I ended up writing a book uh, called The Sleep Revolution. And so my one, like, first... Um, Micro step for managing a busy modern life is prioritizing your sleep. Now, let me just explain something. There may be people in this room who don't need a lot of sleep because about one to one and a half percent of the population has a genetic mutation. <laughs> and if you have a genetic mutation, you don't need a lot of sleep. But the vast majority of us need seven to nine hours, and it's not negotiable. And if you get it, everything else will be better, easier, more efficient. So you don't sacrifice anything. I'm an eight-hour girl. And 95% of the time, I do get it. You know, there is always something that happens. Um, a flight is late. Um, a child is sick. Um, even when they are 26 and 28 years old, as mine are. Trust me, my 26-year-old was hit by a bike and had concussion and 10 days ago and has been sleeping in my bed because that's the only place you can actually sleep deeply. Doctors say you feel like you're in the womb again as your, as your brain is rebooting. <laughs> so it hasn't been the, the best of sleep for me the last 10 days, but these things happen. And it doesn't matter. What matters is what do you do on an everyday basis. And if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, you know that my life is very busy. So it's not about slowing down. It's not about not being busy. It's simply about how we show up for everything we're doing. Are we fully recharged or are we running on empty? And, but I have to give you one little critical tip um, for getting a good night's sleep and making good decisions, which is, Picking a time at the end of the day when you declare an end to your day. Because I bet absolutely everybody here can say there is never a real end to your day. There is never, an, there's, there's never a moment when you can say, I have done everything I could have done today. If anybody here can say that, you don't have an interesting enough job. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, who's in the front row, is a is an alum and she's the controller at Thrive Global. So thank you so much for producing a great alum. And I'm sure Melissa cannot say that she finishes everything every day. In fact, we have a, one of our cultural values at Thrive is relentlessly prioritize and get comfortable with incompletions. So given that, you have to declare that arbitrary end to the day. And the ritual way that I recommend to declare that end to the day is turning off your phone and gently escorting it out of your bedroom. <laughs> because sleeping with your phone is just a very, very dangerous thing to do. Because your phone is the repository of every project, every problem. And in order to get a full night's sleep, you need to separate yourself from your day life. We were talking earlier about your great culture, yeah. that I'm, India is my favorite country in the world. Uh, Indian food is my favorite food in the world. Greek is number two. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's so much about the culture, the Bhagavad Gita, that really tells us that. Actually, there is a, 
there is just the, we just launched Thrive Global in India, so I was um, looking again at the Gita because it talks about these three lives, and you know the first life is the is the is the life of inertia, you know what we would call today the couch potato, you know people who are not engaged in life. I'm sure there's nobody in this room like that, but the second life is the frenetic life, the life of being always busy, always on. And that's not the best life either. The third life is the life when we also recognize, you know, that we all have a centered place of strength, wisdom, and peace in us. And when we tap into it, everything else is better. Thank you. That just made my day. You quoted from the Bhagavad Gita, and that's uh, perfect. <laughs> so. Um, let me switch gears a little bit. You've named two leaders. You talked about FDR and Pascal Chabot, I think. So are there other people that have inspired you or that you can turn to and think of them as people you admire and leaders you emulate? Well, my, actually my most, um, the, the role model of a leader for me is uh, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, because Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor and a Stoic philosopher. So he was in the arena. He dealt with every problem you can imagine, uh, plagues, invasions, betrayals, but he always managed to remain unflappable. And that's like, for me, an incredible quality of leadership. Um, not, not being um, at the mercy of, um, events and circumstances and uh, not being swayed by what's happening, but being able to remain in that um, place of equanimity and dealing with everything um, from that place. And interestingly enough, we, one of the things we're doing on Thrive's media platform, because Thrive is two things. One is B2B, we go into companies and work to transform their cultures um, and the other is a media platform that looks to help change the culture through a combination of data and storytelling. So we bring together the latest scientific findings that prove without doubt that well-being and performance are tightly linked. And then stories uh, of role models of people in the arena who are practicing these things. So we had a piece, for example, by Jeff Bezos and the title was, Why Am I Getting Eight Hours of Sleep is Good for Amazon Shareholders? <laughs> and he analyzed his decision making. And he uh, analyzed the fact that when he gets six hours, he said, my decisions are five to 20% less good. And when, um, when your decisions are less good, the future of the business is less good. And, also, another thing that he said, which is very interesting, is that if you want to be part of every decision in the company, you're going to micromanage everything, and you're not going to be able to attract great leaders. Because great leaders don't want to be micromanaged. So that's another side benefit of actually taking the time to take care of yourself. So. Um I think those are some wonderful tips on leadership that you've just shared with us. Uh, our audience also had many questions on Uber and your role on the board of Uber. So if I can just uh, move the conversation to Uber, you were on record as saying uh, one of the rules should be no brilliant jerks allowed. So can you elaborate on that and your uh, involvement in that whole um, uh, Uber struggle? Yes, yeah, so um, I got so involved because um, when um, last February, February 2017, Susan Fowler's blog appeared about the sexist um, nature of Uber culture, I was the only woman on the board. So um, I stepped in, I spoke at the first all hands after her post appeared to make sure that uh, employees knew that the board was going to hold management accountable, that there were going to be changes. We brought in Eric Holder to run an internal investigation. We gave them complete access to everything in the company. Um, the investigation led to 47 recommendations, which the board uh, adopted unanimously. Um, I 
then proceeded to chair the um, committee to look for the new CEO. So it was a very, very um, involved time. And a lot of friends were asking me, so how are you managing to keep building your own company and <laughs> being so involved in Uber? And my answer was, um, I have not watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> I have not watched House of Cards. I'm completely illiterate when it comes to modern culture this year, but I did get my eight hours sleep every night, <laughs> except on the few nights when we had all night board calls. <laughs> So um, I said that the first all hands, you know, but the, the rule that no brilliant jerk should be allowed in our company, because in a lot of hyper growth companies, top performers are idealized, and top performers are allowed bad behavior. And that sends a message to the whole company. I think what we all learned from the Uber um, experience is that culture really matters. It's not just a saying that, uh, as I wrote in a piece for Time, um, culture is a company's immune system. Uh, you're not going to be able to fix human behavior overnight, uh, but what happens if you have a strong culture is you, you identify problems quickly and you can deal with them quickly before they become toxic and permeate the whole company. So do you see that then as a failure of some kind of corporate governance in that case, that we weren't able to anticipate and catch this problem in time? Um, basically, a lot of Silicon Valley startups um, have boards that are almost entirely consisting of major investors. Yeah. I was the first independent board member. <coughs> And um, so that creates sort of a, a different experience. Um, you know, as long as uh, the company continues to grow, and of course, um, Uber um, was a phenomenal success when it comes to growth. You know, valued at $70 billion, the most valued, the most valuable unicorn. Um, I think right now, um, especially after SoftBank um, invested $9 billion and um, allowed uh, different people to exit and uh, um, be able to get some of their money out. Uh, the process is quite different. We are going to be in the process of hiring three more independent board members. Um, I already brought in um, a second woman board member, which I think proves the truth that when there is one woman board member, there will soon be a second woman board member. And uh, we brought in Wanding Martello, who is the CEO of Asia, uh, of Nestle Asia. And now we have a third woman board member, Urs Ursula Burns. So um, I think we are in a great place in terms of corporate governance and, um, and also in terms of the new cultural values that have been adopted. So on that point of having women on the board, there are some countries like Norway that kind of have this quota system that you need to have 30 to 40 percent of your board uh, uh, as women. And we don't have that in the US, and I think on average it's about 20 percent uh, women. Um, how do you see that? Do you think mandatory quotas for women on boards is a good thing um, or not? Um, I, don't, I don't believe in quotas. Um, I believe in changing the culture um, so that we can accelerate um, the changes around women on boards, but I also believe that it makes a huge difference when a woman is on the board uh, to make sure that she doesn't for long remain the only woman on the board. And once you're on the board, you have a lot of power to make sure that happens. So we should look around at wherever there is only one woman on the board and make sure that changes. And have you observed having women on the board actually changes the culture in the organization itself? I think having women in any leadership position, I do believe changes the culture, whether on the board or top management. Um, in many, many ways. Um, one of the ways is um, in identifying 
a culture of burnout in addressing it. I think women are more sensitive to that. We have the data that shows that women in stressful jobs have a 40% greater risk of heart disease and a 60% greater risk of diabetes. So women internalize stress differently, which is partly our problem because we are more perfectionist. We, um, we are uh, more likely to be self-judgmental. We have what I call the obnoxious roommate living in our head, <laughs> you know, putting us down, uh, reminding us of all that we're doing wrong, while men can just brush it off and move on, which we should learn to do also. Um, so women are, pay a higher price in cultures of burnout. And uh, we saw that clearly at Uber. One of the reasons is that burnt out people operate at their worst. We can all see it in ourselves. I don't know about you, but I can totally say that when I'm burnt out, I am, I'm, the, I'm the worst version of myself. You know, I'm more reactive, I'm less empathetic, I'm less creative. So, I'm sure that applies to everyone. And that's one of the reasons why it makes such a difference in the culture. So is that the part that Bruce said would be controversial then? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you have to hear it tell us afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so um, a third topic that came up a lot from our questions was about the role of media today and what's going on in the media industry. And early on, you took a stance uh, on fake news. And I think a big question is, how does the public regain trust in media, given what's been going on in the last couple of years? Well, I don't think the public can regain trust in the media without any changes in the media. <laughs> uh, I think the, um, the public has to become infinitely more vigilant um, about um, what is out there. Because right now, you know, more people get their news from social media than from mainstream media. So I think it's, it's really important to, to draw distinctions. Um, and for me, the most important distinction is between fact and fiction. Um, as someone said, you know, everybody has a right to their own opinion, but not to their own set of facts. And that's really the key. Um, you know, there weren't millions of illegal... Uh, people voting in the last election period. You know, it's not a matter of opinion, it's not a matter of whose side you're on, it's not a matter of who you voted for, <laughs> it's just a matter of fact. And I think that's the key. We need to keep standing on this foundation that there is such a thing as truth, uh, that there are facts, and that they go beyond right and left. So I, I actually think the right and left distinctions are very obsolete. Um, while I was still running the Huffington Post, I had asked our reporters to stop using right and left. They're just very lazy ways of describing what's happening because the biggest problems we're facing right now are not uh, right-left problems. I mean, the growing income inequalities is not a problem that only the left cares about. Um, if you care about the stability of a country, which is a very conservative principle, you should care about growing inequalities unless you want to be living behind um, gated uh, um, communities, um, protecting your children with uh, a security force, which is what happens in many countries where inequalities have reached a completely unsustainable level. Um, the growing opium epidemic, um, climate change, why are these things right-left? Why do you have to be on the left to care about climate change? I, don't, I really don't get it, you know? Um, so that's why I think we need to change the way we're describing issues and, um, and stop kind of this polarization in, in terms of uh, how we address them. So you think the media should self-police itself and take on a role and earn back the trust of the public? I mean, first of all, there is amazing work being done by the media. I think um, a lot of the problems right now are coming from social media. And um, obviously from Fox News, let's be frank. You know, there is... <laughs> and again, that's not because of, of who they support or what their 
beliefs are is because of their very lackadaisical use of facts. And um, that, for me, is the key. What's your view on regulation now that we're hearing a lot about social platforms need some regulation? What do you think about that? I'm always in favor of um, tech companies beginning to change things themselves. And let's see if that happens. I think it's very clear that the need is there, not just because of the impact on our politics, not just because of what happened with Cambridge Analytica and the abuse of personal data, but uh, also because of what we've discovered about the impact that the hijacking of our attention has on our mental health and on our anxiety and depression. And especially among teenagers, there's no parent who is not worried about the impact of, of excessive social media consumption on their children. So for the last set of questions today, I want to get it a little more personal. And uh, some of the questions that came up were questions about what keeps you up at night. And if you could speak to your younger self, what would be one decision that you might change? So um, the only thing that keeps me up at night is my children. <laughs> I, um, I really have been pretty good about uh, not indulging in negative fantasies, which is what normally keeps people up at night. Um, you know, as Montaigne said, there were many terrible things in my life, but most of them never happened. Um, but when it comes to my children, I'm a, a compulsive negative fantasizer. Like, if I don't get a text back within um, five minutes of my texting, I imagine them, I imagine the worst. It's terrible. I'm working on it. I, I admit, I don't want to be like that. Uh, but that's the, um, that's the one thing that can keep me up at night at the moment, if one of them um, is dealing with a problem or suffering from concussion, as is the case right now. Uh, other than that, I, I believe that every problem can, can wait until the morning. <laughs> that's a great philosophy. <laughs> um, so I think you've said, you were quoted as saying once, Give yourself peace by dropping a project that you know you will never achieve. Assess, does it really matter to you? So the question is, how does one know ahead of time whether this is something worth pursuing or not? Because on the one hand, you're told to pursue your dreams, and this seems counter to that advice. No, actually, what I meant, what I actually said is that you can complete a project by dropping it. Uh, what I mean by that is that very often we start projects in our heads that we don't really put energy behind. And, and very often, they may not be work projects. They may be like, in my case, I, I'm a terrible skier, and I always wanted to become a good skier. And it was always like a project in my mind that I would become a good skier. And uh, my children like to ski, so I wanted to be able to ski with them, etc. And then one, one day, as I was kind of looking at my incomplete projects, I realized, you know what? I'm never going to give it the time it deserves. So I'm going to complete this project by dropping it. That's what I mean. It's like, are there things that you've started in your head that realistically you realize they're not really priorities, that other things are going to take precedence? If you just declare them complete, just declare them complete, it just frees up an enormous amount of bandwidth. And um, it's just a very satisfying feeling. And so now, um, I, when I go skiing with my daughters, I, uh, they ski and I read a good book by the fire and drink hot chocolate. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think après ski is often better than ski itself, yes. <laughs> so um, I think if you were to design the MBA curriculum today, do you see a role in that curriculum for classes on meditation, classes on well-being, and so on? I see a, a role in the curriculum for anything um, that helps um, build great leaders. And uh, knowing how to uh, bring the best out of leaders, the best decision-making, um, includes you know, meditation and sleep and um, 
taking care of yourself in order to have the maximum impact that we started this conversation with. So absolutely, uh, it also has an impact on ethics. You know, when you're running on empty, we have the data now that your ethical behavior is, uh, is also degraded. Um, so it has, a, it has huge consequences on every aspect of our behavior, which is why this conversation is no longer just a part of um, health magazines, but it's part of the Harvard Business Review and uh, courses taught at um, prestigious business schools like this one. And that's a big and recent change. And it's an incredibly welcome change. Um, so the last question I want to ask is, I'm a marketing professor. I also have two young children. And I'm concerned about the messages that marketing sends out to young women these days. And you have two daughters as well. That's something we share. And I wanted to ask you, how do you confront that? And how do you deal with all the messages that are coming out from marketing to young girls these days? You're absolutely right. I think worse than just everything that's coming from marketing is what's coming to them from their own um, social media feeds. Uh, and it's often the way, for example, if you're on Instagram um, and you are young, you are constantly end up comparing, um, you know, the inside of your life with the outside of everybody else's life, the highlight reel of everybody else's life. And uh, it's kind of easier when you are out of that stage of life and you have your own foundation not to care about that but when you're still building your foundation it, it really makes it very hard especially when you're constantly in, interrupted with buzzing notifications of um you got another like of your salad photo or <laughs> you <laughs> Um, or you break up, you know, I mean, um, it's just amazing. What uh, We had a story on Thrive about um, young women and young men who break up with someone, which has happened to all of us, right? And then they end up compulsively following their ex on social media and seeing them happy with a new girl and or the new boy. And it's just like an enormous amount of... Uh, unnecessary pain that has led to unprecedented um, uh, amounts of depression, anxiety, and suicides. So it's something very serious that we need to address. And um, for the first time, 2017 actually was the year of the Great Awakening, when we began to see the unintended consequences of what we've created. And uh, this is like the moment of recognizing we have to do something about it. And there are three ways to approach it. Thrive Global is focusing on empowering the individual. We've lost, for example, um, an app, the Thrive app, an unusual name. And it, uh, um, it helps you put your phone in Thrive mode when you want to be undistracted. When you want to have a meal with your family, you want to do deep work. And if I text you while you're in Thrive mode, I'll get a text back that you're in Thrive mode until such and such a time. It also gives you um, a mirror of your social media consumption. It tells you how much time you've spent on each app, on each game, um, every day. And you can set limits. Um, it's available on Android at the moment, but in the summer it will also be available on iOS. So there's a lot that technology can do us to help us navigate technology better. There's a lot tech companies can do so that they don't aggressively use machine learning and algorithms to hook us, and especially to, to hook teenagers like your daughters. And, um, and the third thing is regulations. And I hope that um, we'll get a lot done with one and two uh, because that's always the most effective way to proceed. But we may also have to move into regulations. Thank you, Ariana. And I think your own life and the way you live it is also a model for children and people all around the world. So thank you for that. I think we'll turn it over to the audience for questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, 
And while somebody comes up to ask a question, I want to invite you all to write on Thrive Global about your own stories. You know, we find that the way to change the world is to um, have people tell their own stories, whether it's sto stories of um, burnout or stories of um, your own ways to manage your life more effectively. Um, we would just love to have you. Just email them to me, ah at thriveglobal.com. Oh, tell us your name and what you oh, do. Sorry. Um, my name is Christy DeBrien, and I'm an uh, EMBA student here. Um, I work in uh, investment management. Um, I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and talk to us. I actually doesn't take away from your eight hours of sleep tonight. <laughs> um, and I know you've met you. My, my question is, um, you mentioned that you had some role models, Marcus Aurelius, and, and maybe FDR a little bit. But um, what... Um, what, what importance have mentors been to, to your career and you um, accomplishing your career goals? Well, personally, my biggest mentor was my mom uh, because she um, taught me about failure and about risk taking. And I find that often women have a hard time taking risks because we're afraid to fail. And my mother's motto was always that failure is not the opposite of success, it's a stepping stone to success. And so that uh, was something which really helped me a lot in my life, you know, launching um, new companies uh, which never have any guarantee of success <laughs> um, and being comfortable with the possibility of failure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Raj, I'm a second year MBA. Thank you for being here, it's been great listening to you. So my question is something that's been troubling me for the past few years since the proliferation of the supposed paid media. Almost every piece of news that you read or watch comes with views. Do you think news must go along with views? Like when you're presenting an article, you just report what has happened and limit yourself to that? Or do you also offer your view on what has happened in that? piece of information that you're providing. Why can't you limit your views to just like one hour editor, like an editorial towards the end of the night or like, yeah. Um, so I think that there is uh, just news, you know, there is um, um, reporting that is just news, but you're absolutely right that there's been a proliferation of opinion and commentary which is definitely what more people gravitate towards. And one of the problems with social media is that the algorithms tend to, um, to veer towards confirming people's biases. So if machine learning knows what your bias is, you're going to be fed more and more of that. And that's one of the problems. So it begins to reinforce your already preformed opinion and makes it much harder to be able to distinguish fact from fiction. Hi, my name is Evan. I'm a husband of a CBS uh, student and also a physician. Um, so from the healthcare uh, field, one issue we face in the hospitals is the lack of sleep that patients get at night and the constant waking up of patients wherever you are in a hospital in the country. And I was wondering if you ever thought of any ways to innovate healthcare so that sleep is prioritized in a hospital setting to promote healing. Absolutely. Um, I actually have a whole section in my book on sleep on hospitals and doctors because so many accidents happen because of um, doctors and nurses who um, are simply too sleep deprived to function optimally. And it's kind of stunning that even now when we have all the data um, about um, the impact of sleep deprivation on our ability to function, um, a lot of um, these antiquated rules about resident hours, et cetera, continue. Um, so there are a lot of, of people in the medical profession who are working to change that. And the same applies to how we treat patients. You know, we know that constantly interrupting uh, the sleep cycle 
makes it harder to um, strengthen your immune system, and your immune system is what is uh, the first defense, right, um, against disease or towards recovery. So there is an awful lot that has to be changed, um, including making hospitals more hospitable in terms of noise and uh, lights, and they seem to be made now for machines rather than people. Maybe you can write about your experience. I would love to. Please do. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jenny Ray LaRue. I'm a second year MBA student, and I also run a blog on consulting that's popular and growing very fast. Well, we would love you to cross post what we you're should. writing. Let's do it. <laughs> because, no, that's, that's, that's kind of the principle of Thrive. We say it's not about exclusivity, it's about good content. So um, that we can give you greater distribution for what you are writing. We have about 25 million users cross-platform. And um, our motto is ubiquity is the new exclusivity. Um, so we would love it. AH at thriveglobal.com. OK, great. And you can always bug Melissa. Melissa, are you Melissa at thriveglobal.com? Yes, Melissa at thriveglobal.com. She'll, yeah. make, she'll, she'll take special care of you, right, Melissa? <laughs> All right, we're set. I have, a, I have a question as well, but that was more than I could have asked for. So uh, my, my question is just related to the transition over to AOL. How did you decide when the right time was to sell? And did you have mentors or advisors in the process when you were thinking about that? So it was um, 2011. Uh, when I decided to sell because um, I felt that we would grow faster through the infusion of cash that um, um, we were going to get by selling to AOL. Uh, I wanted to grow um, our global presence. I wanted to grow video. Um, I wanted to grow our contributor platform. And as a startup, we would not be able to do all these things at once. And indeed, you know, um, we, we grew in 17 countries. Um, we had a massive video operation by the time I left. So it really, really paid off. And um, it, uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, my board wasn't sure. They preferred to wait and <laughs> do an IPO. But uh, in the end, they were convinced. Um, and um, and it was great. And I was there for, we sold in 2011 and I left in 2016 um, because um, my mission, um, I realized, was now to, to focus 100% on spreading Thrive, both through companies and through changing the culture. And um, it was hard to do that while staying at Half Post. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anand. I'm a first year, and uh, Professor Jahar is actually my marketing teacher right now. So hopefully I get that age. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't count for class participation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what? If you write on Thrive Global, it may count. <laughs> So uh, my question is, uh, sleep is extremely important for us to function, but would you not say that the long hours, the sleep deprivation was necessary for you to become successful? Well, thank you so much for asking that question, because I would say categorically no. Um, it doesn't mean that people don't succeed while burning out. What I'm absolutely sure is that they would succeed uh, with less cost to their health, relationships, happiness, and maybe succeed more without it. And I am absolutely certain of that. When I look back at my life, I made a lot of bad decisions. I can say categorically that uh, all my bad decisions were made when I was running on empty, including hiring decisions. Um, but now we have a lot of leaders saying that. You know, Bill Clinton famously said, um, all the bad mistakes he made, he made when he was tired. He did not specify what mistakes. <laughs> uh, but I think we can look around and see 
um, leaders constantly um, acting in ways which uh, do not support uh, what they want even, let alone um, what the country needs. Um, and there is a direct correlation. So I know, I know that it's hard for people to believe that because we have been living under this delusion that burnout is a price of success really for so many decades. It really goes back to the first industrial revolution when we became enthralled with machines. And the goal with machines is to minimize downtime. But the human operating system is different. Downtime is a feature, not a bug of that system. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carla. I'm also an MBA from first year with a professor here. <laughs> And my question to you is actually about Thrive Global. So it's, I mean, overall, the well-being is seen as a soft skill, which is still undermined. So has it been a challenge for you as having it as a main focus of your business? And how have you approached this for people to value it? So that's, that's a great question. Um, obviously, our business is, is based on the belief that well-being and performance are closely connected. And in order to practice it, we, um, we have a few cultural values um, that we've actually finally put in writing. And uh, one of them um, is uh, to recognize that sometimes, you know, you may have to work longer hours or meet a deadline to then take what we call thrive time. You know, to take time, whether it's an afternoon or a day or two days, to completely recharge. So it's not like coming to work at Thrive is chilling under a mango tree. Right, Melissa? I mean, it's, it's hard work. There's nothing wrong with hard work. The problem is when you don't refuel. The problem is when you let yourself go on for long hours and, and continue kind of um, to operate with less and less of yourself. So we definitely um, are working to practice, you know, everything that we... Um, bring to companies and to individuals around the world. And we are, there's a long way to go, and we, I hope we keep getting better every day. Hello. Uh, I'm Rachel Wasser. I'm a first-year MBA, and I also want to thank you for being here. This is really terrific. Um, I have a question for you. You said that Thrive is primarily about kind of presenting facts around wellness and um, well-being and science and then presenting stories. And you were also talking about journalism and the role of facts and the role of opinion. And one thing I've noticed is that it seems like science journalism is particularly hard because the facts are very complex. Uh, and so given the content that you're presenting, I'm curious how you think about that problem um, and how you guys kind of handle that at Thrive. So we are focusing on um on scientific findings that are pretty um, confirmed. Like if you take um, the science of sleep, there, there are certain findings that are now conclusive. Uh, the science of sleep is relatively young. The first scientific sleep center was at Stanford in 1970. But there's more and more science about the connection between um, sleep and our health, sleep and our brains, you know, the, one of the uh, best scientific findings um, is, the, um, is the recognition that the brain has only two modes, awake and alert, or asleep and cleaning up. And when we don't give it the time to clean up the toxins that accumulate from the day, a lot of bad things happen, including the recent connection they found with Alzheimer's. So everything um, that we publish is from um, scientific journals or um, academic institutions that are um, beyond, um, beyond a sort of uh, any kind of questioning. Thanks. Thanks. 
Hi, I'm Miriam. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm a second year MBA here at Columbia. Um, I'm also the mother of three. And for seven years before CBS, I uh, climbed the corporate ladder and experienced many of the difficulties that women face in those scenarios. Um, I've heard women in leadership positions advise younger women to freeze their eggs or delay having families as one way to cope. Um, I clearly have chosen a different path for myself. And I was wondering what your advice is to young women today who would like to grow a, a family on the side um, and achieve senior leadership positions. So I don't think there's one way to do it. You know, I think there are many, many different ways. Uh, the only thing I would say is that um, I have a lot of friends who didn't want to be mothers, and that's totally fine. But if you want to be a mother, then one way or another make it a priority. You know, either by freezing eggs or by have the way you did it, which I'm sure wasn't always easy, but I bet you're really happy you did. So um, that's, that's all I would say. I always tell my friends, if in doubt about children, have them. <laughs> you know, if you are clear that you don't want them, absolutely fine. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Gladys, and I'm on the Student Leadership and Ethics Board with Bruce. Thank, um, one of the th points that came up that really resonated with me was diversity on boards and the thought process that women add, especially with launching Thrive. What does that look like in terms of bringing diversity of thought and the right people on your team for you? So we, we are very uh, intent on um, diverse hiring. We're in the process of a big hiring spree at the moment. We closed our Series B, and uh, we are using um, that funding to um, expand our production engineering team. So if you know any people who want to come and work with us, uh, productizing our IP and producing behavior change uh, uh, products, please let us know. Um, and also hiring a lot more writers and editors and salespeople. So we are hiring in, in every front and we are very, very committed to um, diverse hiring and, um, and to continuing to um, bring in candidates who um, are from different backgrounds. And we do have more women than men. Hi, my name is Lauren Din. I'm doing an executive MBA at Columbia currently. And my question is, you know, what is your personal definition of success? And if it has, how has it evolved over the course of your career? Um, great question. And I'm, I'm actually, I didn't tell you that we have two Indians on my board. <laughs> so there's definitely a, pre um, a prejudice in that way. So I actually wrote um, the entire book of Thrive on this foundation of redefining success. Because um, if you go back to ancient philosophy, whether the Greeks or India or China, um, there was always this definition of a good life. And in modern times, we reduce the definition of a good life down to the definition of success and success down to just these two metrics of money and power. And I think the third metric, which is like the third leg of the stool, which is about well-being that we talked a lot about today, wisdom, wonder, and giving. So I think being able to integrate all that creates really a full and good life. Thank you. My name is Cheryl, I'm an MBA graduate and I currently manage a team over at AIG doing risk management and insurance. My question for you is, um, first of all, I want to say about your daughter, I have a teenage daughter who suffers from post-concussion, so I wish her all the best oh, and all the so health. Thank you so much, thank and, you. And uh, if you need some good neurologists, we have them. But uh, uh, also seriously, when you're talking about diversity and diversity in hiring, and now we all understand that diversity is not just gender or race, but age and lifestyle and education and, and um, 
ancestry and things. But on the other hand, while trying to have a diverse workforce, now many companies are using AI to actually take out all identifying factors from resumes so that you don't see a name to determine gender or to determine maybe racial or ethnic background, as well as address to take out socioeconomic factors. So how do you balance those two things of really trying to take away all those personal factors where it's really just a, a meritorious resume versus trying to build a diverse workforce? So I am... Um, yeah, I have a strong feelings about this. <laughs> Because I believe that uh, to expect artificial intelligence to solve all problems is to really miss the fact that artificial intelligence may one day become more intelligent than we are. But it will never become wiser than we are, more creative than we are, more empathetic than we are. So I really feel that um, we need to prioritize developing our humanity at the same time that we are developing um, AI. In fact, um, we've developed this whole module that we call augmented humanity. So while people are celebrating augmented reality, we want to celebrate and cultivate augmented humanity. And if you are approaching hiring from that point of view, you realize that creating a diverse and inclusive workplace um, is the right thing to do in human terms, and we now know it's also the right thing to do in business terms. So we don't have to rely on AI to do that. Well, I think the point is that what some companies are doing is in order to prevent issues about not hiring certain people because of their background, that they are trying to sort of wash the resumes so that those identifiers are gone. I would and change I the people in recruiting. Okay, great. No, I think, I think it's very interesting. It's just it's a new process now. Yeah, I mean, I think if you have people in recruiting who would not hire people because of race, gender, or any other kind of um, identifying characteristic, you have the wrong people in recruiting. <laughs> My name is Martin. I'm a first year MBA student. Um, I'm going to take it back to sleep. And I, I very much believe in the things you said about the importance of sleep. Um, I think How many hours do you get? Uh, I get eight hours a night. Fantastic. Can much, you write about it? Um, I do not write about it. <laughs> <laughs> I try to talk if you, to people. If you about write it. about it, we'll put you next to Jeff Bezos. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send you an email. Perfect. So, my question is I think there's, there's two steps to it. I think one is in convincing people that it's important to them. Um, and it's useful, and the second step is to empower them when, they, when they're in an environment that doesn't appre appreciate it as much as they do. What would be your advice to a lot of people around here who might end up in a, in a, in a job like investment banking where, they, where they're sort of the culture is to actually work all night? What would your advice to them be to how to talk to their bosses, to the managers, um, that it's important to them and they should actually, uh, should actually get that sleep? Uh, great question. Well, first of all, things are changing. You know, we work um, both with um, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, and we work specifically on uh, to change the culture around burnout because it doesn't work anymore. And, and we are becoming more and more cognizant um, at all levels that it's not working. We work with Bank of America. And... Uh, at the same time, as you rightly said, multiple behaviors are coexisting and at, uh, in financial institutions and other companies, you have uh, the whole range of behavior. You have managers who are very cognizant of the need for employees to recharge and you have others who continue to operate in a kind of what I call pre-scientific way <laughs> about these things. And, uh, and now, though, there is much greater awareness and greater listening. So you are much more likely to be able to tell your manager or tell your colleagues um, something that is not working for you and be heard as opposed to uh, even like a few years ago um, not be able to be heard because of, um, of a completely different expectation around workplaces. 
And the other thing, though, that is important for all of us to remember is the problem is not really just work-life balance, it's tech-life balance. Because even if you are in the best workplace, if you go home and you are hooked on Instagram, Netflix, Candy Crush, whatever, you may still just end up turning up for work in the morning exhausted. So it's what companies are doing, which is very important, and what companies need to change, but also what we as individuals are doing. Thank you. Hello, I am James. I am a student at the Data Science Program at Columbia. And uh, my question is, Technology has always been used to influence opinion. So when print media came out, when the radio came out, and right now with social media, uh, technology has always been used to influence um, people's opinions. And even though we, are reg we might be regulating you know, social media on Facebook, there will be new technologies that will come about and be potentially used to manipulate opinion and I feel just in the same way as how a company's culture could immunize the, you know, the company against um, bad actors, um, a society's culture might also be powerful in preventing technology from having an undue impact. Um, how do you f feel we should develop our culture in a way so that uh, the, you know, the op opinions or the desires of the few wouldn't be able to um, over-impact society as a whole? Um, thank you. That, that's a great question. I mean, we are finding now that a lot of tech leaders are beginning to rethink a lot of what um, technology was expected to do. I mean, recently, um, Jack Ma, for example, gave a speech in which he said that the last decade was about muscle and the new decade is going to be about wisdom. And he has started talking about the need to go not just beyond IQ and beyond EQ, um, to go to what he called LQ, the love quotient. So I think we have a lot of more leaders today who are looking at... Um, infusing technology with humanity instead of being simply um, enthralled with technology for its own sake. You know, we, we went through the phase of like children in Disneyland, you know, um, being really excited by AI and machine learn, learning and what algorithms could do. And now we are growing up and realizing that all these things, if they're not infused with humanity, are not going to lead to the future we want. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Charles. I work for the executive education uh, part of the business school, and we're always looking for new speakers, so you're welcome to, uh, to come and speak on one of our programs. Uh, my question's more around, um, I, I've been in the US for about 18 months now, and I wonder, as a, European, a fellow European uh, background and experience, do you think that, help you to, that helps you to succeed in the US, considering America is famous for its individualism? Where are you from? Uh, I'm actually French. You're French? Yeah. Mom's oh. English. Great. Um, so, uh, are, you say, are you asking whether just the American individualism has helped in so, my own trajectory? Yes, in a way, because I find America is famously individualist and Europe, Europe is quite the opposite. And I wonder if your European background and experience working with the BBC, working in France, and obviously if you're being from Greece, has influenced your success in the US. Because of course, I think individualism has probably been the, the root cause of, of Trump being elected. And I wonder if, I mean, it's maybe slightly controversial, I'm sorry I'm insulting all the Americans, but <laughs> uh, I just wonder if your success is partly due to your, uh, I guess, European background and experience. Um. I don't, I don't know about that, but I know that I, I've kind of loved being an outsider. I think there are benefits in being an outsider. 
Um, I had a hard time for a while, for a few years, uh, with my accent. I did try to change it. And then I met Henry Kissinger. And he said to me to stop worrying about your accent. He said, in American public life, you can never overestimate the advantages of complete and total incomprehensibility. <laughs> And as we know, um, we see plenty of evidence of that right now. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I'm Jordan Gelonzo. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I've really been moved by the conversation, so thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, my question is around best practices, particularly uh, since we're all media consumers, uh, how would you advise us to enter this brave new world of, of media consumption? Uh, and how do you yourself uh, consume media? So my first advice is to end all notifications. Uh, you really honestly do not need to get news notifications because you're going to pick up the news very quickly anyway, and you don't need to interrupt your day. Uh, by having multiple news outlets tell you the same thing again and again and again. Um, I, I have no notifications from anything on my phone. Uh, I think you need to kind of really redesign your phone so that it actually serves you instead of controlling you. And uh, therefore, you know, Managing the way you consume news is key. I think living in a perpetual state of outrage doesn't help anybody. And um, I think we need to be very careful about that because it's very hard to, be, to have a real impact if you exhaust yourself perpetually sort of texting your friends or WhatsApping your friends about how terrible one more tweet by the president is. Trust me, I'm just as appalled as the, as the rest of the civilized world. But, but my being perpetually appalled doesn't really help anybody. So if we're going to actually have an impact, we better preserve our energy. And one of the ways to preserve our energy is to end all these random and duplicative <laughs> notifications. I'm no longer in the news business, so I can say that. <laughs> Except the ones from Thrive, right? Well, Thrive, you know, doesn't do notifications. You know, we, uh, we publish on social media, we have a newsletter, um, but it's not like constantly in your face. Hi, I'm Zareen Durrani. I'm a, actually a first year MBA student at Fordham University. Um, right now, I'm attempting to pivot from a seven year oil and gas career into like technical product management. I know there's a lot of other MBA students that are definitely utilizing their time. At Perfect. Columbia Technical product Fordham. management. We are, ma we are hiring. Uh, <laughs> I, have your I didn't know this was going to be a recruiting opportunity. <laughs> I was wondering what sort of grand pivots have you experienced in your life, and do you have any advice for those of us that are attempting to pivot? Oh, my life has been all about pivots. I'm a, I'm a big believer in pivoting and in, uh, in, in trusting, you know, that if suddenly you are drawn to something else to honor that and, um, and to take steps to follow your new passion. And, you know, ideally, are, are you now full-time uh, studying here? Uh, full-time at Fordham University, actually. Yeah, just at Fordham. You are, yeah. But you are studying full-time. Yes, I am. Great. I think, listen, you already pivoted. Congratulations. <laughs> um, we did a video series on pivots, on turning points, and um, we are big believers in that. Thank you so much. And you know what I'm going to say. You must write about your pivot. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to get the last question. <laughs> well, I, to, I would have too many questions to, uh, to ask you. But I wanted to thank you. Uh, so I, I was thinking a little bit about what was uh, unusual tonight. Uh, and I will say that you know, uh, having so many, you know, first women walk forward and ask you questions was quite impressive. I was wondering, where, where are the guys here? I was getting a little worried. Then they came up as well in the 
in the back of my mind, I, 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 forgive me if this is not suitable, but I, I think you appreciate this, I was saying, well, this must be what equality feels like, you know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think that is, alone is a, great, uh, is a great achievement for us. And we learned many things, too. Uh, I, I achieved at least five projects tonight uh, while you were while you're talking, because I, <laughs> I, I dropped them. Um, and, and I also, you know, we often have speakers who come in from different uh, perspectives. Uh, and tomorrow we're having a speaker come in who's, you know, I'm not even sure what the city's more on the, on the conservative, moderate side of things. But I think you're right. I was trying to figure out, what, you know, left or right, should you be describing people this, this way? And I think that's a very profound, you know, view that really we should not be doing that right now. We should be looking for ideas and common ground, and I think that's really quite, quite useful. Um, so I think it's a remarkable night, and uh, I really want to thank you very deeply for, for coming here, and I want to thank my dear colleague, uh, Ethan Johar, for, uh, for her questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, and I, I really also want to thank you all for asking questions. I mean, I think the, the level of the questions was absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. And we have to uh, thank uh, Olivia and, and uh, Shirley, uh, who's, who's here, who uh, are amazing and for the center, and also all the people who have worked for us uh, 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 tonight. And we have a special event. We're going to have a book signing happening afterwards for uh, Thrive and, and the Sleep Revolution. Um, so please join us for that uh, as well. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. I really enjoyed this, uh, this talk and having you here. Thanks. Thank you.